back to Factory Sealed. It is May 19th, 2015. My name is Eric Peterson, and I am joined so graciously today by one Derek Scavel. Hello, audience. <clears throat> That's all. That's it? Mm-hmm. Okay, I was kind of afraid you were going to pull Bill Cosby into this. I had it. I was taking I was taking a sip of beer, but I am thinking about Bill Cosby, that poor guy. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin Byer is also with us today too. How's how's uh, all the legions of Bill Cosby fans out there doing? Well, I think after his latest interview, probably not too well. Did you watch that? <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. He did, uh, it was a Dateline interview. Um, it was something like that, but the interview actually had to do with his um, starting of foundations in Alabama for. Uh, underprivileged children, so obviously a good cause, but they asked him about, hey, how are you going to respond if a child um, happens to ask you about these rape allegations? <laughs> and I can't do it justice right now. By it was, trying... it was the worst it, interview possible. He didn't even come close to answering the question. It was like no. that scene from Billy Madison when he gets up and he's talking about... <laughs> What was in it? The, at the, the very end yeah, of the, the show. Yeah, at the very end, and he's like, that was the worst answer ever. We are all dumber for having heard that. <laughs> you are awarded zero points. <laughs> May God have mercy on your soul. Someone should vine that together, Bill Cosby's was, response, with it, that clip into it. That is quite possibly It was one dumbest. of those things where Christy and I were watching it in the living room, and Derek was in his bedroom, and he just came out around the corner, and he looked at it, and he's like, what the hell is he on about I mean, like <laughs> one eye's off in one direction the other one's looking down and he's that just poor guy like damn near blind he is like absolutely i don't even think he knew where he was <sighs> that's a sad thing i don't know if he's crazy now or if but you know maybe that's his maybe that's his obviously boy. you know hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that you know Doctor. He was still rocking a sweet sweater, though. Oh, yeah. I mean, that Do- guy's got some of the coolest sweaters Dr. in Dr. Huxtable has a good fashion sense still, but <laughs> unfortunately, he has bad, uh, he treats women badly, so whatever, I guess. I Dr. Guess... Huxtable, what's for dinner? <laughs> I mean, let's not even go there. Oh, my God. Oh, Could boy. Could you imagine... The Huxtables bar, like cheers. <laughs> <laughs> My drink's foaming. <laughs> He's like dropping like an Elka Seltzer type of thing into a drink and just like. <laughs> the hell did we get into? <laughs> yeah, didn't we say? So, didn't you say something about you will not bring up Bill Cosby on our show? <laughs> but that's like saying don't think about an elephant because it's gonna happen. I just thought about an elephant. Yeah, exactly. You're welcome. I was thinking of a <laughs> snuffleupagus. But big, oh, really? I was thinking about a real elephant. Big old hairy trunks just <laughs> wagging around. <laughs> big brown trunks. Big old googly-eyed trunks. <laughs> big old eyelashes on them. <laughs> that's oh. snuffy, I tell you what. He For you, those of you who don't know, that's a Sesame Street reference. Yeah, we don't have much of those on Factory Sealed. Trying to keep it educational from time to I time. I decided to bring it back from Bill Cosby, dial it back to a rated G, back down to... <laughs> or actually TVY, if we want to go by the, the ratings here down in America. No, Can you tell me how to... Get... Yeah, it's... Over here. <laughs> Sesame Street, it's around the corner. There's a hobo. Y'all got any more of that Sesame Street? Oh, yeah. Uh, I watched some, uh, like, it was, what was it? It was a Dave Chappelle thing about the, about Sesame Street characters and if they are real life. And he's like, you know what? I think Oscar the Grouch, you know, the guy who lives in, um, in the can. In the can. He's like, I feel he's really discriminated against. And you're teaching kids to hate on, hate on homeless people. And he's like, yeah, Oscar, you're a grouch. And he's like, if I were Oscar, I'd be like, bitch, I live in a fucking trash can. <laughs> I'm the poorest motherfucker on Sesame Street. <laughs> what is happening? What are, what's the, what, what are we talking about today? Oh, my God. Well, Kevin, how are you? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. How are you, Eric? Good. How's, we've, how's softball we've, going? Softball. We haven't had a game since the last show. Oh, really? No, because uh, late games, I had a late game last week on Wednesday, mm-hmm. and 
that time doesn't work out for me because that's when I get drunk and play NHL 15. Oh. So you're so, in a drunk NHL league as well? Yes, yes. Is this something that you just play at home or do you go to a friend's house? Well, <laughs> I have friends who come to my house. Oh, so. naturally. Who's your yes. team, team of preference there, Kevin? Uh, currently, we're playing as the New York Rangers. Why not Ooh. the Phoenix Coyotes? Because they're the worst team. <laughs> Their fans even cheer against them. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see that? No. Yeah, they had a fan that was at a game, and the Saber, they were playing the Sabres, and Sabres scored, and there was a guy in a Coyotes jersey right Just behind cheering. the glass. And, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> oh. So yeah, that's why I didn't go to the Wednesday game, and then the Monday game was canceled because it's a holiday up here. I in hear we good old Canada land. We threw a huge wrench into the Talk and Reckless uh, schedule this week. Yeah, I know. Everyone was like, "Hey, let's do a show on uh, Tuesday because Monday's long weekend and everyone's out of town," type thing. So I'm like, "Well, I'm not going to be having none of that because I'm on this show to talk yeah, about yeah. Final Fantasy VIII, whoop, whoop. and y'all can go suck a dick." <laughs> <laughs> awesome and the dick was sucked <laughs> so yeah so uh show got canceled this week so now here i am nice. fresh off my final fantasy 8 completion yes congratulations so thank you thank you we are all done this is it we this... we have accomplished what we set out to achieve i'm kind of proud of us to be honest yeah, you know what? We invested a lot of time in this. I think we did it the right way. We brought up Bill Cosby and Sesame Street <laughs> along the way. Um, threw in Bar some, League skeet shooting. Bar League skeet shooting. And uh, what? I can't even remember anything from the first show. The first show still had – Jess was on the first show because yeah. she was still in her, I'm totally going to play this game mode. Yeah. And she was about four and a half hours in. She was just barely out of Ifrit's cavern. <laughs> she, was, she was like – she was 15 15- minutes in on a good playthrough <laughs> like if, if you know what you're doing and you're trying to get through she's like 12 to 15 minutes into the game easily and then i asked her right before the second show like so are you still playing along with us she's like no i i stopped playing there was too much pressure <laughs> too much pressure for crying out loud we didn't do another show for like two, two months. months it was actually closer to three. Oh my goodness yeah, yeah. we had a lot of time to get done uh that's disc okay. two. And, and to be honest, I but feel like we still kind of crammed was the it. Disc, right? Yeah, no, just three was the longest disc. I think Jess is a good example, actually, of you know seventy five percent or you know twenty five percent of people, you know, might get frustrated and give this game up early on. Yeah, stick through it, guys. This game is great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we, if you're, I don't know why anybody would be jumping into the show at disc four, but we set out each of us with a different intention well i don't know if derek really had an intention other than to just play it kevin set out to do a low level playthrough and we'll i guess we'll find out if he actually achieved that i set out to find out if squall was actually dead jess set out to actually finish the game and i think derek just nailed it on the head she encompasses most people that play this game get into be like this is too different and then stop playing and then derek just played it so he's your he's the control I'm just variable. I'm just, he's just the wide-eyed little kid who's like, "Oh my god, it's Final Fantasy." I'm just your average dude. Now, I will admit this is my second time playing through, but a lot. I mean, I and I mean a lot. I don't remember about the storyline of this game. So essentially, it was a great refresher. Yes. So with that, there's not a lot that actually happened in Disc Four, according no. to my notes. <laughs> Ugh. I've only got three, roughly three pages of notes. And this is whereas, on Microsoft. Or this no, this is, is Google, Google Documents. This is on Google Documents. So I can type it up in one location, and then I can pull it up on a different computer in we a got, different location. We got one-inch margins going all around the edges. And it's bullet-pointed. Bullet-pointed. It's a circle and, bullet. And, and I have reference notes. Okay, Thoughts does, to myself. does have reference notes as well. <laughs> so, thank you. Welcome. Welcome Kevin, I can, I can join. I can, I can share this document with you so you could see the notes. Do it. I want to see it. I absolutely want to see this well, pile of whatever the hell you think is. Well, well I'm not right, sharing right. them with you now. <laughs> Come on. No. I was actually part of this. You guys ever heard of that? This online strategy, real time strategy game called the Settlers Online. Did you guys ever play that? What the hell are you talking about? 
Well, it's just a you know kind of like a Sim City like game. Oh online. yeah, yeah. And there are adventures you could go on, and you were, you would join these guilds, right? Of like you know thirty people or something. Uh, like who's that. your clan leader? Yeah, I eventually got kicked out, and I got pissed <laughs> off, and just quit the game altogether. <laughs> Even though I was one of the best on there, suck it. But anyways. <laughs> We had a Google Doc where we would have to sign in to make sure everybody would sign in. Each Nerds. And I'm like, oh my god, this is getting very stupid. And then, Did you play your 15 minutes today? Yeah, exactly. So, a bunch of nerds. I wanna... <laughs> um, so, Disc 4 picks up immediately where Disc 3 leaves off. Uh, Disc 3, correct me if I am wrong, left off with Rhinoa, or Cypher, trying to join Rhinoa to Adele. Or, like, walking her uh, up to Adele. Not, yeah, she, yeah. Cypher just totally kidnapped her kidnapped and then her. just brought her that last 15 feet. Okay. <clears throat> How long uh, did that last dungeon take you guys? Hold on, we gotta go through some shit here first. Oh my god. Eric Fine. is driving. You, you, you drive the show, and I'll just sit here. We are just color commentators. Well, I want to make sure we cover it. Eric is Pat Summerall, we are John Madden. I prefer Vanna White. <laughs> well, I don't know. So you're Vanna White and we're Can Pat's you hold agent? the mouse and we... <laughs> scroll it down when I get to the bottom of the notes page? <laughs> we're trying to think of some other fa- famous, famous, uh, you know... TV How about duo. the dude from Family Feud that kisses everybody? What was his name? Uh, uh like the first host? The yeah. first one, yeah. He used to kiss everyone. Oh, uh... He was like a pervert. Richard Dawson? <laughs> yeah! Yeah! Then they had Al Borland for a little while. I remember... Not real Al Borland, but that was... The actor who played yeah. Al Borland? Yeah. yeah. Kevin, do you understand how Google Docs work? I thought you told me you can share it anywhere. Yeah, with another Gmail address. Okay, fine. I will download it and send it to you. You're such a pain in the butt. I, I think you can... <laughs> you're supposed to be able to look at it with a, just, a just ready, another Gmail address. Just hold your tits. Um, Stupid Gmail. Do you have Microsoft Word on your computer? For Christ's sake. I don't know what See, you just said to this me. This is okay, why we it, shouldn't it, take it. notes. Too long. <laughs> we shouldn't take notes because of this. Everybody, we just... Come on. Yeah, there's no reason to ever take notes, because if you have to take notes, then you're just going to have to look at them. Look at how many awesome conversations we've had because of it. Yeah, yeah but, you know, yeah, come on, Eric. Yeah, yeah. Let's be real. Here. My first note of this disc is Adele looks like a dude. Yeah, she kind of did. Yeah, I guess. So maybe <clears throat> Adele was a dude. I wish they gave more... I. And, you know, they didn't really give much background about her, and I wish they just would have done that a little more. No, they basically said she was a terrible sorceress at the time of Estar, and that was it. And then Laguna was responsible for sealing her away, and that was it. Hey, Square Nix, make a prelude to this game. <laughs> They're not going to do a prequel. Damn it. Because that'd be Final Fantasy VII. No, it'd be like... What the hell would you even Final call that? Final Fantasy 8-1. Eight eight minus minus <laughs> <laughs> you could. Instead of the after years, just call it the before years. Yeah, there you go. Ooh, the prior years. Before Squall. Pre-Squall? Pre-Squall. Yeah. So you you bounced right into a battle with Adele and Rhinoa. Adele is absorbing Rhinoa, drawing health from her. You can right. actually heal Rhinoa. Right, and... Can that... she die in that battle if you let Adele draw her too much? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if she, and, and if you use, like, AoE spells or whatever, and you accidentally kill her, then you just get game overed. Yeah. Really? Yep. Yep, and uh, the strategy I took is I cast Regenerate on on uh, Rhinoa right off the bat, because oh. Adele was drawing, like, 700 hit points from her, and, you know, my regen... I wonder if it was based roughly. off Rhinoa's health at that point in the game, because my Rhinoa had, like, maybe 1,000 health total. And how much did it draw from her? Each time? Like 1,100, so I don't think it's based off that. Wait, so she only had a... Th- no, how much did Adele draw from her each time? Like 1,100. And how much total hit... How many total hit points? Renoa had less than 2,000 hit points, and she really? drew like four or five times. Huh, yeah, maybe it has something to do with stats, because I built Renoa up to about level 54. I left so. her at 14. 
<laughs> selfie <laughs> selfie's the only one I left at fourteen. I touched my other three people precisely zero times. Selfie was supposed to drive Ragnarok. Yeah. So I'll be getting that and then Irving for me was supposed to just sit there and hit on her. Be yeah. your typical douche. Well, they both did their jobs extremely well. Heck yeah. Left them to their devices. And then Rhinoa, half the time you don't even get to use her. So like, I'm not going to fight with her. She's a pain. <laughs> I just don't, I mean, I don't really care for her weapon. It just, the Angelo Cannon. I just don't like her little. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, you know, that doesn't sound cool at all. If you throw a Frisbee at something, it's not coming back. <laughs> Oh, whatever. I yeah, guess. a gun blade is totally realistic. You it could is. totally put a blade on it the end is, of a gun. It is, Kevin. <laughs> you could bore a barrel down the tip of a of a blade and have a gun. It probably wouldn't be very accurate. But if you slice well, somebody and mid-slice pull the trigger, you it, don't need that, it to be accurate. Is that All what's right, let's actually become happening? international arms dealers and sell gun blades. Yeah, is that what's actually happening? Yes. That's why yeah, it makes that's, the that's gun sound when you attack. I guess I never caught that. Yeah. I you know, because you know, if you for the Final Fantasy thirteen players out there, um, you know, lightning would actually do like a backflip attack where then she'd do yeah. and you'd see her actually shoot it. Yeah. Squall, but she just, didn't have a gun blade, she had guns. It and had it, a blade on the end of it. That's called a bayonet. This is it a sword with a gun in it. Look it up sometime. It kind of, it's a hybrid pistol gun blade thing. Gun dagger? It's like a gun blade pistol. Yeah, it has, it has a, <laughs> it doesn't have a, yeah, I would say it's a gun blade pistol. It, it's not a strict bayonet, like, but it's I got, hated I that game. whatever. I don't okay. care. Back to eight. Back so to you, you beat Adele, Laguna shows up and he's like, hey, now's your chance. And then Rhinoa somehow comes back to life. And she says she was inside the young Adele alongside Altamesia. So Altamesia was actually where she wanted to be. She was back inside Adele. And that's when time compression begins and shit just starts to get super weird. And as you're on your way out, Laguna takes a second to remind everybody about love and friendship and courage. And that whole conversation from the last disc where try to get back to a place that you remember your friends. Um... What'd you guys think of that cutscene, the transition in? Uh, you know, at this point in the game, you're kind of getting, at least I am, I was getting a little anxious just to kind of get through the game and see everything string along, but it was very confusing. You know, I, I knew that they had to just all think of each other and, you know, remember their friendship and they would end up in the same place. And they said they were going to, what, meet at the orphanage or something like that. I think so, yeah. Is that what it was? Yeah, so, a place where they're all familiar. It's just a lot of it didn't make sense, but I figure, you know, in my eyes, I'm like, this is just Final Fantasy being Final Fantasy because sometimes the story. Well, is suddenly just they're skydiving, and then they land in an ocean, and then they're scuba diving, and then they show up. Well, Rhinoa says something like, I'll probably just disappear. Squall yeah. comes in with his trademark, just stay by my side. What a Debbie Downer. Yeah. <laughs> wah, 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 they end wah. up in a room full of save points. All of them work. I did check four of them. I right. checked I checked <laughs> quite a few of them. I saved at every single one of them. <laughs> Maybe it unlocks a trophy. Uh, you show up back in Adia's commencement room, and there are multiple Adias. And you go through this huge battle of Adias around different locations all over the world um, before finally arriving at Adia's house, which is no longer destroyed. But you see... That battle was so freaking annoying. Yeah, it was so long. There was It wasn't difficult, but I would say you had to probably fight ten iterations of her. Well, at least. I think the point of it was it, it was to demonstrate time compression. Um, because, like you said, Eric, it wasn't wasn't they weren't difficult battles at all it was just more uh oh look where we are now i spent more time just looking at the scenery and seeing yeah. where i was i'm like oh i'll attack with one person now and oh you're would... in fisherman's horizons yay now you're in Estar. oh you're in chocobo forest okay now you're back in timber yeah, i know so it was all over the place delling city hey but uh when they get to adia's house there's a bunch of dead white seed on the ground and someone makes a comment about how we're fighting across generations now and Ultimisia's castle is anchored from the sky down to the, the ground, and that's pretty much what sets the stage for the final dungeon. But if you want to, you can actually kind of 
waylay that for a minute and do... There's two things you can actually do out in the world map right now, and I went and did both of them. Uh, oh, yeah. what could you do? You can go and get the Ragnarok. <laughs> which Isn't that like a, like a two-hour mission no, or something? It, Doesn't it take super long time? It took five minutes. Oh, okay. I thought I, guess that's... I was reading it in the guide, and they're like, "This is a really long and slow process." That's why I didn't do it. So when you come up the chain, <clears throat> you've got three portals on the left side. You can jump across to either one of them. The second one takes you out to the Centra Plains, and you can walk. If you just throw Encounter None on, it goes by really quick. I could see where it'd take a long time if you didn't have that on, but you just walk around the bay to the nearest uh, Chocobo Forest, and for being a Final Fantasy game, I was kind of shocked at how far into this game it was before I saw and rode my first Chocobos. It was over 51 hours. Yeah. Walked into the Chocobo Forest. There's this little dude there who talks to you about the Chocobo game. And I said, I don't care. And I gave him $1,200 to just catch one for me. <laughs> you know, there's this whole thing about the Choka Sonar and then the Choka Ziner. And you have to do this little mini game. And I said, I don't care. I am rolling in seed cash. Take the twelve hundred. Yeah, that's bucks. the one thing about this game is like money about a quarter to a third of the way through the game just loses all meaning. I would as say long as you do the seed. That. Yeah, if you do all of the seed stuff right at the very beginning and get up to the seed level twenty, I had almost three quarters of a million dollars by the end of the game. Yeah, I had. That's I, it. Holy. Yeah. I had six hundred and fifty thousand without even trying. What'd you have? Uh, I had like half a million, but I never hit beyond seed level. I think I finished the game at seed level 10. But you didn't buy much stuff, did you? Well, there's nothing in the game to buy. <laughs> See, I was buying shit left and right, just like potions and stuff at the beginning, just to max stuff out and upgrading weapons. The thing about it, yeah, and <clears throat> the really big difference in this Final Fantasy is the insignificance of Gil. I mean, it's yeah. just like... It's nothing. It's 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 very insignificant. I like mean, Final Fantasy VI, you have to sit and grind so you can upgrade and buy new weapons exactly. and armor. Exactly, and that that is one thing I missed about this game was the insignificance of not having to really, um, not really having to have that money to get the diamond armor, so to speak, yeah. or you know, pick. Like yeah, I mean, th basically they just took instead of farming for equipment, you farm for your abilities, right? Yeah, you like farm, you farm your guardian forces up, and you farm levels if you want to. Right. Yeah. Do, but you never have to farm for that that next piece of item because there's really no reason to ever upgrade your weapons at all. Yeah. yeah. And I, I I don't know. I didn't upgrade absolutely everything. I upgraded squalls and I upgraded just like I made a point of getting his lion heart, like going out of the way to do it. But nobody else, I just upgraded as far as I organically got. Um, yeah, I upgraded Squall's weapon once, and that was it. I didn't upgrade anything else. I will say this is the first time, though, that I've played this game and actually gotten one of the final uh, final weapons. So I don't think the final weapons were all that difficult to get. Um, no, they're I just ended up, tedious. I mean, you need some key items that, like, you need the, like, when you got the, the Brothers uh, Guardian Force, you needed to, I think it was Minotaur, you have to refine his card to get adamantine which you need for zell and squalls uh final weapons and but and there are a couple others like that i can't remember i think the energy crystals of uh the energy crystals from you need for like quistus and renoa it's really hard to kind of get those um unless you're fighting very specific enemies but for the most part i thought getting the the weapons was okay well, I went and got the Chocobo, and then as soon as you get him, you can ride him down. You find a beach, and I didn't know that the Chocobos can walk across the ocean. Just the standard, the it, bog standard Chocobo. They can't walk across the deep water. They can walk across yeah, the shallow water. Light but if you stand still, they start to sink. So you can walk around <laughs> the continent and show up on the other side of the Central Plains and then walk up to the Ragnarok and get it. Takes you... No way. Well, there is one th one other thing that you can do with it. You can go find the Queen of Cards, and she is on the southern tip of the Estar Plain. And apparently she came down from the Lunar Base in an escape pod and crash-landed. But there is no indication on the world map of where she is. You just have to walk around and just happen into her. Um, 
I fully expected not to win anything from her. I just did a battle with her to say that, hey, I fought the Queen of Cards. Because I still had the stupid random encounter, or the random draw on. And she pulled all of these amazing cards. I'm like, I'm not going to sit here and lose everything. So I hopped back in the Ragnarok, went back, and went into Ultimacy's Castle. That is quite literally all you can do in the world map on Disc 4. Did either of you do that? Fun stuff. Nope. I went straight no, to the I, castle. I didn't care. I just went straight to the end. Yep, I did. I was more invested in that at the time. Kevin, tell us about the dungeon. So, first thing that ha- happens is you get all of your abilities uh, locked out. So, the only thing you can do is attack. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you go around this dungeon, and it's it's a, a massive maze with different puzzles you have to do, different items you have to get in different locations, and run to the other side of this giant map to to use them in certain spots. And every time you do one of these little puzzles or in certain areas in this dungeon, you find a boss. And when you kill that boss, then you can unlock one of your abilities. So I hated this dungeon with a passion. This part right. Because for some suck. reason... <laughs> For some reason, the person who who did the walkthrough I was reading, he, like, I don't know if he just was really, really stupid at the time or whatever, but for some reason in this dungeon, he wrote it from the perspective of Squall and which direction he's facing. Are you so serious? When it's like head, yeah, and I, it took me so long to figure this out because he's like, head to the left and go down this thing. And, and the castle kind of mirrors itself. Yeah. So in certain places, you can follow the instructions and it will still work out as if he knew what he was talking about. But after doing that and being like, okay, there's no way this is where I'm supposed to be. I can't see any of the things that are supposed to be here. <laughs> I just had to do everything that he told me to do opposite. Uh, ugh. And Gross. and that was a huge hassle. Huge hassle. How'd you like... So yeah, uh, I, think there's, uh, <clears throat> I think there's seven bosses I think there's eight. in the dungeon. Seven or eight, Th- yeah. Yeah. Most of them are super easy. I I was telling Derek, I only had problems with one boss, and it is because of my own stupid ignorance. Um, I think Was it's, it uh, the Iron Giant or whatever it was? Yes, the Red Giant. And that is yeah. because I was stupid in the order of which I unlocked my abilities. <laughs> so I started with Draw and then Magic, which was probably stupid. I don't think I needed to draw anything. Yeah, I was about to say, like, what were you going to draw at this point in the game? <laughs> I don't know. I, I guess I was hoping that I would come across some aura, but then as soon as I unlocked it, like, well, I've got 40 aura already on right. each character. There's no way I'm going to need don't more really than that. Don't really need it at that point anymore. So then I decided I should, the next boss, try point. Mm-hmm. I'm going to unlock magic. And I go, I don't ever cast magic. I probably should have <laughs> gone with the command abilities because I used recover and revive the most often. And that's what I decided to use. That was my first choice. So, Red Giant was the hardest one for me, not because he was kicking my ass, but because I didn't have Doom Train to cast Meltdown on him. Right. And I <laughs> I ended up just using the Magic Meltdown on him. but And I fought him at a time... Well, no, Meltdown didn't work when I cast it on him. Really? Yeah. Well, maybe I... So, every attack, I, I fought him... He had, like, 30,000 hit points. Every attack I did... Did somewhere between eighty-eight and a hundred and twenty hit points. It was. I can't believe you. Oh man! It was a long battle, and then halfway through, Gilgamesh shows up, and it went yes, and then he misses. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, you son of a bitch! Oh, that's funny. Yeah, darn Gilgamesh. No, I used uh, I used Demi. Yep. On him. Yep. I decided to cast Demi because that takes out like a third of his hit points, right? I think it's a quarter. Uh, a quarter of his hit points. But it only it it doesn't consistently work. Uh no, I hit it every single time. Because the first time I did it, it took out six thousand. Then it only took out a thousand. Then it only took out like two hundred. Well, right, because his uh, really? his because it's always taking out a quarter of his hit points that are left. Yeah. So but if the math he has on le- that didn't add up. Oh yeah. Because if know. I cast it when he had thirty. Or twenty eight thousand or thirty thousand, a quarter of that. I guess I don't know them. You'd bring it down to twenty five, mm-hmm. then a quarter of that would be, you know. 
Yeah, no, mine worked just as it should. It was like seven thousand, then like five and a half thousand, then like four thousand. But yeah, huh? Maybe my characters didn't have their magic shit all the way up. Yeah, that's weird. That's possible. How about that painting puzzle? Did you? Holy! Oh! Did you actually try to beat that without the guide? Uh, no, no, I did not. I was... Even with the guide, just finding the paintings was frustrating enough. That was a garbage puzzle. It square. was, and Come I on. don't. I feel like something. I feel like I would have remembered a piece of that, but maybe I hated that puzzle so much that it's like, you know what? This thing sucks. I'm not committing any of it to memory. Essentially, there are twelve paintings around this two-story room, and you have to view all 12 of them before you can solve the puzzle. And then there's this huge pu- this huge painting down below, and you have to choose three of the titles of the other paintings to push together to make the title of the big painting. And the only clue in the entire puzzle is there's a giant clock on the floor that has three hands on it, the hour, the minute, and the second hand, and they're pointing to four different numbers. I think it's like eight six, and then four, but the Roman numeral of four is written incorrectly. It's written as four vertical eyes. And Well, I did not even notice that. I didn't notice that either. The key to solving the puzzle is that the um, the number that is being shown, the V's stand for the V, and the I's stand for the I. So if there's a V followed by three I's, it would be a word that starts with V and has three I's in it. So the one that was <laughs> I, 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 I was um, intervagilium. There, intervaginum? Did, yep, intervaginum. Oh. So the other one was Viator. It was, because that was six. It starts with a V, has one I. And the other one was eight. So it was Vivardium. It started with a V and had three I's in it. So that's the cl- that's the key to solving that puzzle. It took me forever to figure out because I wanted to do it without the guide. And then I the way that I figured it out a- happened to be the way that. And and you see, it, it, yeah, go ahead, Kevin. I was gonna say it just blows my mind because like the first time I played this game was without a guide, and to. To play the game with a guide and without a guide, you just look at every situation so much differently. Yeah. Because you, you read the guide and you're like, okay, well, this next room is going to be a puzzle and I'm going to go find these pictures and then I'm going to put in this thing and, and then we're done. Yep. But when you don't have it, you're like actively like paying attention to everything that's going on on the screen. Like you're studying the background and you're you're looking at the clock and the hands and you're like, oh, I wonder what that means. Yeah. and I, I have to say I was honestly surprised that they would put a puzzle like this so deep into the game just before you're about to like be in the most exciting part of the game. And there were the no other puzzles like this in the game. I know, at all. and it, it, like there wasn't any inkling. Like I know if you played Final Fantasy X, there's the the glimpses. You remember that? Remember those oh, little glyphs, yeah, yeah, the glyphs or whatever it was called. And so you come to kind of expect you know difficult puzzles and stuff like that. And this was really the first one that was in the game. Plus, I, I was all fired up to go and uh, complete the game, so it was like, all right, let's get let's get through this. I don't even want to look at the, or I'm just going to look at the guide, use the guide right away, and get out of here. Um, so, yeah, I was a little surprised that they decided to use, um, have such a difficult uh, puzzle at that point. That was, but I mean, I I can give it to them too because it. It's not a mandatory puzzle, right? You don't have to unlock uh, all the abilities that get locked out before no. you go find yeah, Ultimisium. you're right. Okay, yeah, I'll give that to you. I forgot about that. You could just go straight to Ultimisium if you wanted to. Yeah, I guess you could. <laughs> just attack? You would yeah, die. Just straight up attack. <laughs> um, I went through and fought all of them. Did you guys? Yes. Yeah, so did I. That... Looking back, though, I think uh, I could have done it with just attack and item. That would have been all I would have needed. I could have done it with... Um, attack, magic, and limit break. I was going to say limit break was the X factor for me, and yep. I'm definitely glad I got it. I didn't cast a single GF against Ultimecia, so I could have done without that. I could have done without item. Um, I probably would have needed the, the uh, command options or the command menus, like revive and restore. Right. Mm-hmm. So I could do it with four. But... You don't need to. You could very easily, if your people are, if you're confident enough in yourself, just go straight in and do nothing but attack. 
You know, you, actually, no, you can't. You would die. No, I don't think you could do it with because this. of her health. So. Her health judgment spell would take right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But before we get into fighting Ultimecia, let's talk about Omega Weapon. Uh, he's kind of the hardest boss of any Final Fantasy game that kind of exists within each of the games. Correct. Right. He's... Yeah. He's he's like Sid. He's like the bad guy Sid. Because in seven, Omega Weapon was under the ocean. Correct. Yeah, uh, emerald weapon God, wasn't, wasn't he it? wasn't he like he was four different ones in that game oh um, he was ruby emerald the, emerald was flying through uh, the sky s- i believe ruby was in the sand outside gold saucer yes and i think you're right i think omega, I think omega was... was underneath the ocean you needed to get the submarine to go get him i think so oh maybe that's the one that you needed to ki- oh, yeah i think you needed to kill the other four to make omega and weapon then it appear. would unlock it yep and all four the of them were of increasingly yeah, right. difficult. Yes. Yeah. As and so, in Final Fantasy follows suit here with making an extremely difficult. Just uh, get it. It's not one of those things that you just walk into the boss. Oh, no. There's a stupid setup. So the thing that we forgot to mention in Ultimacy's Castle is that you're separated into two parties. So obviously oh, yeah, you right. take your great people and then leave your shitty people together. And there are a couple puzzles where you have to switch between the parties. So there are green switch points. So, like the elevator puzzle, which was a pain in the ass. Uh, <laughs> just couldn't figure out where to go on that. And Yeah, there were a lot of places where it's like I was exploring around, and then, like, 45 minutes later, I walk into the same room, and I'm like, holy crap, there's another exit to this room? Yeah, That's I kind know. of the downside to the pre-rendered backgrounds, but... Final Fantasy VII did a good job of that by allowing you to press select and it would put little green diamonds or red diamonds above entrance and exit points to the room. So I don't know if I yeah I don't know if I dislike that they didn't include that, but it's just something different. Um, but to get to all to actually get to Omega, there is a room with an organ in there, and you see this glowing purple ball, and that's kind of your clue that oh shit something happens here. Um, so outside that, outside the, the, the cathedral is a switch point. So you put your good party there and then you take your shit party and you walk him into this room with a giant bell in the ceiling and you have no real indication that there's a rope hanging down because it kind of blends in with the background. You ring that and then a timer starts and then it eats 12 seconds of your time watching the bell ring. And then you have to walk up to the switch point, switch over to your other characters and then run into the organ room to find Omega. But the thing that pissed me off is that every time I tried this without encounter none on Squall, the walk from the fountain into the organ room, I'd get into a battle. Or if I'd make it into the organ room, I would walk up to Omega and get in a battle with not Omega. (laughs) It happened like eight times. And finally just said, screw it. I'm going into the battle with encounter none. Yeah. That's that's how, I mean, there's... For the one stat, like, you have one of your guys with Bahamut and his four ability slots. So, basically, encounter none, you just throw on that guy, and then it's just like he's one of the other people with just three ability Did slots. Did you get the Rosetta Stone, where you can add uh, four ability slots to another GF? What? Yeah. Yeah, you so can if get you that and play into, the order. Damn. The, it's kind of a little bit of a process, but if you walk into you have to do the elevator puzzle where you go across and get the floodgate key yeah then you walk down to the room where you fought the iron giant and just outside there's a there's a a lever you can unlock using that key and then if you pull the lever it lowers all the water in the floodgates then you go back to the organ room and you have to press all eight keys absolutely simultaneously and on a controller it's fine but I was playing it on the Vita where I had to treat the touch screens in the back as the R2 and L2 keys. So I would <laughs> press it and then I would walk outside and just down the way there's a room that ha- or there's a, a hall with a door that had eight spikes sticking up. And if Oh, that's right. I remember that door. If all the spikes were down, you could go through, but I would always have one left. And finally I just got lucky. And if you walk through, you can go down below into the channel where the water was and you get the Rosetta Stone, which gives you the ability to have four ability slots on another GF. Totally worth <laughs> it. Yeah, wow, I totally wish I would have found that. There is another Rosetta Stone available in the game. Is I can't there? remember exactly where, but I had two characters with four ability slots. So 
Um, it must have happened somewhere Maybe else. Maybe two GFs have it, though. Maybe. I guess I didn't check that. No, only, only Bahamut has it. Huh. Huh. Well, I spent... At least I'm 90% sure it's Bahamut, but I know only one of them has it. I spent a solid hour prepping for my battle against Omega, and the longest I lasted against him was two minutes. Wow. And I have to say that's about the same with me, too. Um, I uh, just kind of dove right into it. I did do a little preparing, but I didn't do as much as Eric did. And there was just no way. He casted this one spell. Um, what was it called again? Terra Nova I believe... or something like that? Oh, I was going to say, since your guys were all pretty much max level, I figured you would have got wrecked by his level 5 Doom at the beginning. No, because we went through and made sure to junction 100, 100 death. death to our status defense. <laughs> right? The thing that killed us was there. he he casts a spell that just rains meteors down on it, but it wasn't meteor, and every meteor that hits is like 4,000 hit points. And they right. cast like 16 of those down. There is no physical way that I can think of at the level we were fighting him that you can beat him without the holy war item right so the only stat or the only strategy that i think would work is you get everybody up with aura and then you cast holy war on them so they're invincible and you just go to town because i was able to get two lion hearts in on him each one doing between 150 and 200 thousand damage and he still didn't die wow right wow yeah no he has uh he has just over a million hit points yeah Boof. how much did he have for yeah. you uh, he's he's always level 100, no matter what. So he had See, a million See, in the guide we were looking at, God. it said anywhere between 110,000 and 1.1 million. Yeah, that's what our guide said, but whatever. Yeah, no, he he does technically have level 1 stats, because it's all a math formula, so you can scale it down. Yep. But he, Omega himself is, is always level 100. So he was hitting you with the same shit he was hitting us with. Yes. Jesus. Oh my God. Did you... Did you have the Gilgamesh card to refine into Holy War? Let me tell you guys about how awesome card battling is in this game. Yes, please do. So, the thing is, if you spend 7 to 10 hours card battling, I mean, don't get me wrong, that does sound like a lot of time. That's a, <laughs> because it, it is. It is a lot of time. But uh, once you've spent that time card battling... Refining the cards into these super obscure items makes the rest of the game a cakewalk. Like, I mean, you guys said that, like, Eric was 51 hours. Derek, what were you? 57. 57 hours. Yeah, I was I was 41, maybe 40. Jesus. And that's all because, like, these items that you get so early make you so powerful that nothing else really matters. But yeah, I did have the Holy Wars, and... It was it was still a super stressful fight for me because I uh, never managed to get any auras. Oh, Oof, so I had to go into the fight with everybody at six hundred hit points, oh. and then hopefully throw a holy war up before I got killed. And then just the mad panic of, oh my god, Holy War just went down. I sure <laughs> hope this thirty-five minute fight doesn't get wasted before I can get another one up. Oh my goodness. Can't you draw aura <laughs> from him? No, not at uh you can't draw aura from him, no. Uh, he has meteor or no, he has flare and he has holy. So how many attempts did this take you? Uh I one shot it. You one shot Omega? Hats <laughs> off, friend. Yeah. Jesus. Wow, dude. <laughs> yeah. I no, it was it was it was really stressful for uh, for the first little bit, but I, I got triple and haste on everyone at the beginning. With Cerberus? Because he always starts with level 5 death. Uh-huh. And uh, none of my guys were multiples of 5, because they're all level 7. Wow. <laughs> so I didn't have to worry about that. So I could spend my first turn getting triple and haste on everyone, and then a holy war. And then everyone after that was just hammering out limit break after limit break. Did you like actually go through where... and cast triple and double on everyone, or did you just cast Cerberus? Uh, I cast triple on one person, and then that one person cast haste, and oh. then the third person cast a holy war. Gotcha. But uh, my party was Squall, Irving, and Zell, mm -hmm. because they have the, the limit breaks that do the most damage. Because they are the men. Yep. I was about to say that, but... <laughs> you sexist pig! But yeah, so uh, it got to the point where 
technically for the amount of like per limit break, like I think Irving did the most damage kind of. Were you using dark But it got shot? to the point where later in the fight I had uh one of Zell's combos memorized. Oh jeez. So I had it on loop and I could go through a full full section of his combo, so four different moves in less than a second. Because it was just like, okay, I know exactly when the timing sound window is for when I start the next combo. And they're all two-button combos. So it was just bang, 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 bang. That's Mock ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was like, I would get uh, the biggest Christmas present ever was seeing like the 12-second dual timer. I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> this is so much damage. <laughs> How much damage were you actually dealing at that point? Uh, per attack with Zell was probably between eighteen hundred and forty five hundred, depending on what uh, duel he was using. Compared to what we were dealing, I mean, our limit breaks were hitting consistently for between sixty five hundred and ten thousand. Yeah, easily. Jesus. Easily. So Squall, Jesus. regardless of his limit break, every like every swipe of the trigger was ten thousand, and there's roughly seven to ten triggers. And then if you get Lionheart. He goes through with like another 15 swings, followed with another <laughs> double swing at the end, so you easily can get 200 grand off of him. But yeah, I could probably get uh, Irving, like I said at the beginning, was the most. He hit between probably 40 and 70,000 per limit break. And then once I got the Zell combos down, I could probably hit with him for around 100,000 per limit break. Wow. And then Squall was just pulling up the rear with, you know, 1,800 or 18,000 kind of thing. Wow. 18,000 to 24,000 he was usually hitting for. So, so yeah, it took me, took me three uses of the Holy War. And I think on the third use, I killed him the first set of rounds after I used How him. long does Holy War stay on for? Uh, I'm not too sure because it's a timed thing, but the timer stops when the limit breaks are going on. Gotcha. So for me, like, uh, it was lasting like probably 10 minutes per Holy War. Jeez. But I mean, in game time, I have no idea what that is because all my time was being filled up with limit break. comboing with Zell or, or spamming the buttons on the, on the limit breaks. Wow. I can't believe you one shot him. That's insane. Impressive, my friend. I probably I gave him a good solid four tries before I realized and each try got significantly shorter. So I'm like, you know what? Without Holy War, I have no hope of doing this. I feel like that is yeah, that, that is essential to Omega. I will say that um for those Renoa users out there, they could maybe use her invincible moon limit break oh, yeah. somehow. Um well, now that you're talking, well. now that Kevin was talking about refining items, I wonder if I have any items that I can go through and refine up to at least three Holy Wars. Who knows? Yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure the only item that refines into Holy War is the Gilgamesh. Oh. But you might have some items that refine into Holies, which uh, are the same thing just for one person. Hmm. Okay. So but not it's, the it's same definitely thing as the useful. spell Holy. Right. Not the same thing as a spell holy, oh, okay. that's right. Huh. But yeah, so it's not quite as useful, but if you... Because, I mean, he attacks fairly mm. slow. He's got pretty slow recharge timer on his ATBs, so yeah. if you kind of pace it out, like, okay, well, I should probably keep someone alive right now because he can res the rest of the party. Yeah. And what what I experienced, too, in the three tries that I did, it seemed like he used the same sequence of spells over in the in the same order. It looked like to me. Now maybe that was just chance, but I don't know. Um, it seemed like I think he, he always casted level five death right off the bat. Yeah. Um, he yeah. A lot of a lot of big fights, like the the hardest quote unquote optional bosses in the Final Fantasy games, usually are scripted. So I mean, you can go through the first time and be like, okay, well he's going to do this, 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 and this. And then it repeats kind of thing. Yeah, I did not have the dedication to beat him, so I feel like you win the gold star for this playthrough. Not only for doing a low level, but for beating Omega. That's That, to me, is kind of the, the crowning achievement of any Final Fantasy game, is cresting Omega. And It would have been nice. 
Well, the only thing that it does is on the tutorial menu, it puts yeah, proof of Omega. It gives you a cheesy little little proof of Omega. You go into the tutorial, and you go into the information menu, and then at the very bottom of that, where it's telling you about all the other things in the game, it's like proof of Omega, and then you click on that, and it's got these lame little hearts on the sides of the screen, and it's like, you have beat Omega! That's dumb. And that's pretty much Kevin it. Kevin didn't even know this. He, he was actually going in and reading the tutorial again, mm-hmm. um, just to make sure, and... <laughs> He stumbled upon that and let us know. So yeah, make sure I was right about the uh, Guardian, Force. Guardian Forces thing at the beginning. <laughs> I like my... Did I got it right? I like my note for Omega. I just put yeah right. <laughs> but no, like uh, like going through um, on the low level made me realize like just how easy it is in this game to do. Yeah. Like it, it's ridiculous. Like as soon as you finish that seven to ten hours of card grinding like the rest of the game is just cake because you... there's not a single fight in the game including omega that's a challenge well and if omega's easy ultimacy is even easier neither of us had a single issue with no. her one so shot kill you run up to all... uh, i did not one shot ultimacy oh <laughs> Used up all his holy wars, I guess. Here's the big. Yeah, I said to myself, I said to myself, you know what? I went through the entire walkthrough or the entire game using the walkthrough. I'm going to hit this last boss boss without it. And what's his name? Casted his holy judgment or whatever it's called. Reaver. And yeah, he just killed me. So let's. It was awesome. Let's get into that. You walk into Altamisia's chamber and. Apparently she can't spell properly because all of her C's are K's and she's yelling shit like curse all seeds and the world was on the brink of time compression and your price. See, I always, you what? whenever I see something like that in a game, I always assume it just means that they're trying to come across that she has an accent and she says her K's really hard. Oh, like a so... Russian accent. Yeah, that's that's what I always think when I see something I actually like, like that. purposeful misspelling. I like that. It always rubs me like that's an accent. They're trying to come across as an accent. I said everything out loud to myself <laughs> in an evil, kind of like a Lord Voldemort <laughs> voice. Actually, curse all seeds. Curse all seeds. World was on the brink of time. Compression. <laughs> he did. I, I actually did. He was Eric was sitting, sitting on his floor watching. It got real long. It actually made it for a really nice ending. Thank you very it much. It did. I enjoyed it. Um, I pictured her to be a little bit more feminine, but... Well, you know, it, well, come on. I can only do so much here. I guess. So, she threatens to send them to a dimension beyond imagination, where they'll Ooh. become slaves. And <laughs> then she pulls them into battle. And I forgot about this. She just randomly pulls three people in. And I had two of my three shitty people pulled in immediately. <laughs> it was Squall and then Rhinoa and Selfie that got pulled in. And then nice. two of them died immediately. And I said, sweet, I'm not reviving them. Because I do vaguely remember them being absorbed into time. So I'm like, great, they're going to die. So they got absorbed into time. And then they brought in Irving. And then they brought in one of my good characters. And before I know it, everybody was in. And... Yeah, it was funny for me because the first time I went through... It gave me two of the three of my party. Like, I think it gave me Irving, and it gave me Squall, and then it gave me... I'm not too sure who the third was. But uh, I wanted to go with Questus for the third yeah. in this fight, because I wanted uh, Mighty Guard up ah, I see. For, for the fight. And uh, so it, the first little bit, I'm like, well, I'll just kill this first boss, and then if someone dies on the second boss, then I know that you know, the new people come in. But, of course, no one dies on the second boss until the super AoE thing, yeah, and yeah, yeah. then I just got insta-party wiped. But then the second time through, the first three people it picked were my were my main team. All oh, three of the people yeah. who were junctioned, ready to go. So you two-shotted it. Yeah, and it was... <laughs> yeah. So, she... Her, her first form is super easy, and then she says, I'm going to call the most powerful Guardian Force. And... I was talking to Derek about this as he was fighting him, and Derek didn't know who it was. I'm like, you, you know who that Guardian Force is, right? And I didn't realize who it was until I scanned him, and it was Griever. And if you remember from Disc 2? Way back now, yeah. That's the name of Squall's ring. With the lion. With the lion on it, it's Griever. And 
if you scan it, it says in the, the, the scan notes, uh, in Squall's mind, Griever is the most powerful guardian force, and with Ultimisi's power, Griever is able to continue fighting without vanishing, whereas most guardian forces, they come in, they attack, they vanish. Ultimisia has given him the power to stick around and whoop some butt. And he is tough. He yes. is the most t- powerful form, I felt. Well, th- this form of him, his first, he, he's kind of, he looks like a, a Bahamut mixed with a lion. I guess that would make sense why Probably. Squall's Lionheart. Um, I pulled out the Lionheart, Limit Break took him out immediately. Um, Ultimisia then joins her, she junctions herself to a guardian force instead of junctioning a guardian force to her she provides him with more power and then that kind of becomes her second to last form where they're fighting in space and this is where she busts out hell's judgment that would party wipe pretty much everybody and for me it killed two of the three people and brought the last person down to one hit point and more often than not the person that was left was fortunately the one who had revive so I got lucky with that. But for Derek, it just brought everybody down to one hit point. Yeah, I don't understand. It. Everybody just went to one hit point for me. But it still was a process, making sure everybody was, uh, you could get health back on them so she wouldn't wipe them out. Um, but it was also nice, too, because it would actually give you a legitimate limit break instead of having to cast Aura. So yeah, it was kind of useful, too. Uh, yeah, and, and that was the thing, too, because I just... Still had four holy wars left over, so I'm just like, well, time to use them. Holy war. <laughs> it was not a tough battle in the least. I understand why you may have had trouble simply because you had a different set of circumstances. But if you have trouble with the final battle, I, I really can't help you. If you make it to that, and point, yeah, like you're fine. The the fight itself was was still really easy for me. It's just I didn't want to wait until my mighty guard regen got any, everyone high enough for to survive that big attack at the end of the second phase. Yeah. So I'm just like, well, holy war and kill him. Yeah. So. And she has one more form where you start attacking her, and every time you attack her, she reveals a different line, like time will not wait no matter how hard you hold on. And I killed her mid-sentence, so I don't know what the rest of the shit she talks about is, but I can't imagine it's too important if they allow you to skip it. Uh, no, it actually is scripted. Is it? Once you get to that point, every time you attack her, she says a different line, mm-hmm. and then when she's done talking is when it'll let you kill her. Oh. Because for me, it killed her the when middle of and. and. That's where she died. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's exactly where she's supposed to oh. die. Oh, okay. wow. Oh, good. Uh, and that's that's the end of the battle, but this ending is easily my favorite ending of any final fantasy game even above and beyond seven just because i feel like this ending wraps everything together and this is kind of where last episode i was talking about how a comment that laguna made destroyed my entire theory for why squall's dead and i kind of get get to that in a minute but after the battle everybody awakes in a white room and Irving is talking about is it so is it over let's go back to our own time and you hear somebody in the distance saying be careful of time warps don't fall into them and I think it's uh, I think it's selfie that says that actually oh is it I think so okay and then it pops into Rhinoa and she's mumbling a bunch of stuff and she says I want to go back there Squall and I promised and Rhinoa's running through the white room and it cuts to Squall who appears to be running through a black room and he has no idea where he is. And someone yells out to him, who I can only assume to be Rhinoa, Squall, where are you going? Um, Almost as if they see him, but they notice that he's going the wrong direction. And out of nowhere, Kid Squall appears behind him, saying that he's off to find Sis. And then a a Dia appears chasing him, and you show up in um, Squall's childhood at the point where a Dia becomes the sorceress mm-hmm. because ultimately, and that when I saw that, like I didn't remember that at all yeah. from the first time I played the game. Like that was like such a such a good scene. Oh yeah, it really was. Well, and I've got to. It just it brought the whole whole story full circle. It's like okay, yeah, well, well, why did a Dia get powers from the sorceress twice? I mean, it didn't really say. Like I mean, sure, the time when she was five. But when she was older, they kind of just glazed it over. Yep, right. But now that you see at the end of the game, the reason she got the powers was because of this time compression, crazy time paradox crap. Yep. 
that it's like, oh, well, man. and there's more of that too because um, initially Squall looks at Adia and says he's not going anywhere; he'll be back. And then Altamesia shows up, like you said, and she, because you, Squall, the party killed her, says in order to die in peace, the sorceress must be free of all of her powers. And at that point, Adia takes the powers to prevent the children from being the one that absorb the powers as a result. And uh, that, yeah. like you said, is a reference to the time where she, the second time she became a, a yeah. sorceress, and it became yeah. a point of fear for her kids. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the dissipation of the orphanage. Right. Everybody gets sent off to garden. Um, so, yeah, so the kids must have been, like, watching through the windows kind of thing, and they saw her take the sorceress's powers, and they're like, oh, man. Yeah, well, I can only imagine, too, you, you take these powers, and it changes you, and she's suddenly not the same matron. But Adia, and this is what I thought was really cool, is Adia actually recognizes, doesn't recognize, but acknowledges Squall. I initially thought this was just going to be the um, observer role yeah. where you're rewatching this. But but Adia turns to him and says, you called me Matron. Who are you? And he doesn't say, my name is Squall. He just says, I'm a seed from Garden. And e- Adia has no idea what yep. either of those are. So Squall explains to her, seed... And Garden are both your idea. So essentially, Squall creates Seed and Garden by planting those ideas within Adia. Pretty much. Yep, yep. And that... But but uh, Adia does figure out who he is, though. Mm-hmm. She knows that that's Squall from the future. Yeah, and she says... Because there's a line later where she says, oh, you're the young boy, or or something along those lines, and you, need to go you back. don't belong yep. in this time. Do you know how to leave, and, or do you need my help? And then young Squall comes up and's like, who is that? And she goes, nobody. The only Squall permitted here is you. So she yeah. recognizes it. But this is the one issue that I do kind of have with time travel stuff. Like you said last episode, time travel kind of sucks because it leaves so many paradoxes and this whole issue of the creation of seed and garden it has absolutely no origin because if you, it just goes in a circle well we think that Adia created it but by the end of the story we know that technically Squall created it by planting the idea with Adia and then Adia creates it but she only created it because and it just goes in circles right. so there's really no true origin point of it because for her to have created it, she would have had to have been told by Squall. But for it's Squall to know loop. about it, she would have had to create it. And it just... It's time loop, man. That's the nature of that. I kind of buy I buy it. Yeah. I buy it. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I like it. it I think sense. it's a really cool idea. I, I completely forgot about that concept that Squall's technically the creator of it. Because he goes back and plants that idea. Um, but yeah, the big the, one of the big questions I had at the end was... Like... We talked about Squall and his his growth as a character throughout the entire game, yep. but then right at the end, and when he's supposed to be thinking of his friends and thinking of being together with them, the first thing he thinks of is himself and transports back in time to the moment where where to to an an important moment in his life as a child. Yeah. Like I think that the reason his room was dark. And why he couldn't find Renoa and anyone else is because he didn't really want to find anyone well, else. And I think the only truth that he wanted to know was was relevant to himself. I think you're right with that because as he leaves, he he goes through a couple lines where he's like, "I'll be all right because I'm not alone." So he almost gets to the point where he takes them for granted. It's like they're right. just they're there, and he wanted some more of that self gratification of I need to know this about myself. But when he calls out for his it, friends, he doesn't get any answer. See, see, I read that just a little bit differently. I read it that he got the little pep talk from Matron, and, and then he was like, okay, yeah, I'm going to leave this time, and I'm going to go find my friends. Mm-hmm. And he's like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call out for them, and they're going to be there. And then he calls out, and the first thought in his mind is, or will they? Yep. Will they be yep. there? And then he immediately starts doubting himself yeah. again. And he says, I can't make it so back I think... alone. And suddenly he's like, am I all alone yeah. again? So yeah, it's like, they they build up Squall so much during the game as like this big redemption and how he's gonna, gonna change and not be such a sheltered individual in the end. And in the end, when it's down to himself and no one else, that's all he can think it's of. himself. Yeah, and this is what's cool because I'm I'm glad you brought that up where they build Squall to be up this big savior. I mean, Garden is relying on him, and suddenly Garden is at the center of this battle, and pretty much the whole world is re- relying on Squall. And 
he he technically doesn't come through. Uh, this this next cut scene is actually kind of cool because it shows Squall in the desert and time is warping and he's just kind of wandering aimlessly. He's losing himself. And then Reno is running through a bright field. So obviously she's got her shit together. She knew this There's is where we promised to be. To be. Yep. I'm there. Where the hell is Squall? And as she's running, she's, she gets these wings and her feathers kick up and a feather makes its way into Squall's gross time and he catches it and he's momentarily in this field. So he starts reliving memories of Rhinoa, but she's a blur, like he can't really remember her. Going through the dance, going through their time on the balcony, uh, going through their time in space and where it comes to, and I don't quite know how to read this, is the scene in space and he's looking at her and her helmet shatters. As if he's completely forgotten who she is. Or she dies. So he collapses back in this black deserted space rock. And this is what's awesome. Is that Rhinoa finds him. And how she's actually the one who saved him. So Rhinoa is technically the savior of the story. I guess I could buy that. Because yeah. she she hugs she, him. Her with her hug, she brings them both back to the field where right. they agreed to meet. Squall had just given up. He's like, whatever, I'm gonna <laughs> die. And see, see, that's the weird thing too, though, because the way I saw that is, I saw it the same way you did. Like she's saving him and everything. But I also was kind of wondering that little the little fishing scene with with Cipher yeah. just kind of made me think that. Is this the same past yes. from before? I can't imagine that they would just different. I thought. It's okay, Cypher. Whatever. Cypher, you're a worldwide you're homicidal an criminal. Uh, we're just going to let you fish. Go ahead. You hang, hang out with your robot and, and your other friend. But, like, <laughs> so I think... I, I busted out laughing when... And Fujin kicked that rage in. Oh, I thought that was. I water. thought that was great. I thought that was great. <laughs> I thought that was, like, the greatest... The greatest single piece in this entire that's game. The, Just that's that the only scene. scene that really made me question, is this the same time loop, yeah. so to speak? Or did somehow Squall destroy this time around, destroy Ultimecia for good this time around? Well, it would have had to have been after Balam went mobile because they you see, see Balam fly over. True. And then yep. it shows Laguna walking through a field, and he looks at his ring. And I thought this was really cool because it kind of tied up Laguna's story, where there's a quick flashback of him before he left to go look for Alone. Yep. And Rain runs up and gives him a ring, so they've got matching rings. And then it's back to the normal screen, and you see Rain Lior's gravestone. Mm -hmm. And then... Did Rain give him the ring, or did he give Rain he the ring? Because I thought he gave it he to gave her. He gave one to her. Two. She gave one to him because yeah, he was I looking at his hand and one. he didn't have one. He had one, and then he turned around when, no, he had when one. she ran up to him to hug him. He pulled her hand and put a ring on her finger. See, I thought when it yes. first went to the flashback because he was looking at his ring in the normal time, right? And there was a ring there, and then he went back to the flashback, and there was no ring there. I thought he was so looking at rain. Rain. Oh, okay. rain came up and gave him a ring off of her necklace. Oh, okay. I guess I thought he gave it to Rain, but so it was something to remember yeah, her by. I think huh. that's the yeah, point. Yeah, I guess of it. I I was kind of mixed up in when exactly we jumped back in time in that. Because if you if you rewatch that scene, it, the hand fades from having the ring to not having the ring. So I'm I'm assuming it indicates that it's the same hand. Hmm. Okay. But either way, Rain's dead. Laguna is, he's probably still president, but he's acknowledging his past, and alone comes running up to him through the field. Kiros and Ward in the background. Kiros and Ward, garden flies overhead, flowers are everywhere, and then boom, the ending song hits. And that's kind of the credits, and during the credits, you get a bunch of random videos of the cast, like, like, Zell gorging himself on hot dogs. <laughs> that and... was awesome. That was, that was an favorite. awesome scene, too. Like, <laughs> yeah. That that little scene of because they they built up the the winter's ball or whatever yeah right thing from disc one and then never talk never happens in the game and then right at the end this little Easter egg or whatever you want to call it I like it of just them yeah. at this this White, well and you you White Mike Tyson just you assume that <laughs> you assume that <laughs> Selfie and Irving get together because Selfie's walking around with Irving's cowboy hat. Yeah, Zell's just eating hot dogs. Who the hell knows what <laughs> happened to Quistus? But 
if you watch those clips carefully, this this is the only redeeming fact that I can come up with to possibly salvage my initial theory that Squall might be dead. So the very last clip... Is that he's not in any of the Flash. Well, exactly. So they're camcording, and the last piece they show is Rhinoa out on the deck overlooking the ocean, and she's looking at something, and she's pointing up, but there's nobody out on the deck with her. You can clearly see there is nobody on the deck with her. But if you, and then the credits go, and there's like another four minutes of credits. But the thing to remember in movies and video games, always watch past the credits. Always. So if you watch past it, there's another cutscene where the garden's flying over the ocean, and it shows from the outside perspective of Rhinoa doing the same thing that you saw from that credits cutscene through the camera. And she points up, and then the camera pans over, and you see Squall next to her. And then they hug, and they float off into space. But my the only redeeming factor that I can have, I truly don't necessarily think that Squall is dead, but this actually kind of solidifies it for me that he could possibly be dead because of the whole time warp thing where he's in this black realm and he just kind of gives up and he's losing his memory. So if he were to have died, maybe disc two, three, and four are just his imagination going wild and now he can't suddenly remember everybody and he's losing his mind and he dies so this final scene is Rhinoa remembering him where they first shared their private they they shared their first private moment and that's that that's my take on it i'm not convinced that he's dead but i think it's yeah i don't know it's just it seems to me like the little because they they never did pan over enough from that shot when it was just Renault on the balcony. So, I mean, you could say that had they shown more, you would have seen Squall. Yeah. But it was just the weird little battery low on the camcorder thing just out of nowhere. It's like... It, it's from, from a, a player perspective, it seems like why as... When you're building this game, why would you do that? Like... There has to have been a reason. I think you, and I think that's awesome that it leaves it up to that speculation of, you're right, the camera angle wasn't ideal. He could have just been around the corner, but why would they make the shot like that? Mm -hmm. So I definitely, I'm going to chalk this up to it's plausible. It's not concrete evidence Squall is dead. It's, It's plausible. I could buy it. I don't necessarily believe it's true because of the whole conversation that Laguna had at the end of disc three about you need to remember these people. These are the only people that are going to bring you back. And that to me is what kind of explains him losing his memories of Rhinoa is like you said, he's thinking more of himself than his friends. Huh? So I'm going to chalk it up to plausible squall might be dead. I'm not going to say he is dead, but he might be dead. I'm going to say he's not dead, but that's the, blatantly obvious look but through that analysis i guess you know there's told you i'd get there in the end i had a point (laughs) my initial point was going to be that whole cut scene where he's forgetting what rhinoa looks like and as you die your your mind starts to go and you're forgetting things and pieces are jumping about and he's going through his life in random order but laguna's conversation destroyed that theory for me this is the only thing that even has legs anymore. Here's something that I want to bring up that you guys may or may not have caught, and it's actually happened in Disc 3, but this is a good time to bring it up now. Inside of Ragnarok, when Laguna, oh, yeah. Ward, and Kuros are inside, um, in the conference room or whatever you want to call it, um, if you go down and talk to Laguna, Laguna says something to the effect like, when you get back, we have a lot to talk about. Kuros, if you talk to him... He says, um, thank goodness you got your mother's look and not your father's. Like, and thank you, good. Oh. And that's, you know, all they say about that. There's never, they never bring that up. I thought they might show a speck of it when they, when they brought up the Laguna and Rain scene. I almost thought for sure he's going to put his hand on her belly somehow, like yep. to signify, like, I know you're with child. But he, type of thing. we know but, that he didn't know because that's why Alone was mad that he left because right. he left without being able to see Rain's child. Right. So I think it's, we can say squall. We can say yes. it. I, I'm convinced, Look, and we had a conversation about this. I'm convinced 
that Laguna is Squall's father. And I'm pretty sure in that cutscene at the end, it zoomed in on Squall's face, like just showing like the top quarter of his face, so like his eye, and uh, kind of his eye and forehead area and his hair. And then they switch scenes and they, they show Laguna in that same aspect, yep. zoomed in like that, and then they zoom out and it's, it's old Laguna. I'm yep. pretty sure that's what it was. Or maybe it was from old Laguna to younger Laguna. Um, I don't remember, but I'm pretty sure. Oh, that was old Laguna to young Laguna. That's how they transitioned that flashback to the rain scene. Ah, yeah, I might have to go back and watch it again. I definitely believe, though, that that we figured out the lineage because General Caraway and Julie got together and had Rhinoa. Laguna initially wanted to get in Julia's pants, but he ended up with Rain and had Squall. And that's how that lineage gets together. Laguna got with Julia, and Renoa and Squall are actually half brother and sister. <laughs> it's a Luke and Leia thing. <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's not that. Wow. Bro. And that's that's Final Fantasy VIII, guys. This game has always been my absolute favorite Final Fantasy. Um, and I have to say, you know, with my opinion, um, I haven't played this game. I've only played it once through. Um, and I really think that this really brought up its stock in my in my. It is a very underrated game because right. I think most people pull a Jess Clarkson and play through like the f- even if you only play the first disc, you're still doing yourself a disservice. You have to make it to at least disc three to really enjoy this game. You have to get the Ragnarok. Yes, yes, and that's a huge commitment. That's about a thirty hour commitment if you're playing normally. What about you, Kev? This has always been one of your favorites, hasn't it? Uh, well, see, that's just the thing. When I played it the first time, I played like I played Final Fantasy seven, VII, eight, and nine back to back to back in like a two month period. Oh, wow! And I think Final Fantasy seven took me the longest. Final Fantasy eight was somewhere in between the two, and then Final Fantasy. Nine, I think I finished in like fourteen hours. What? Because I just powered through it and didn't really beat, care about anything that you happened. You can beat in the nine game. in a very short amount of time. Wow. Yeah, and like that was just the first time through the game. That wasn't knowing anything about how to how to do it quick. I just I was at that point where I just had so much Final Fantasy beaten into my brain in the last little while that I was just all right. I'm just gonna get through. See, it. I played these games, so I think out. that. Yeah, I think that. Uh, Seven, I obviously have the fondest memory of because I, I spent the most time on it. And then eight and nine, to me, were just kind of powered through and, and glossed over. So if you asked me before I played this where I rated Final Fantasy eight, I would probably say fifth or sixth best uh-huh. that I've played. But after playing it again and, and diving into it more than I did the first time, I'd say it's a solid contender for... Maybe number two or number three. I'd That's... give that to you. You're you're pretty you're pretty hard on for six, aren't you? Nothing will will knock yeah. six off its perch. Yeah, I I still maintain that eight is my absolute favorite. But I will admit that going through and playing this now, I found a lot of things that I didn't like. There were hardly any intelligent side quests to speak of. The yeah. world did not seem nearly as populated as even some of the older Final Fantasy games. Exactly. Um, for me, it's yeah, especially in in some of the towns, you'd you'd notice like a lot of dead scenes, yep. like just the background, and you wander through it, and there's no people whatsoever. Yep. And it, I still just enjoy it for the storyline. I love the Rhinoa Squall dynamic. I love the draw system. I love the junction system. Um, the music in this game is absolutely my favorite. To give you an example, Christy put me in charge of the music for our wedding, so. I took the Final Fantasy VIII piano collections and helped put it to organ. So we had it in, we had a lot of Final Fantasy VIII music. All of our pre service wedding music was Final Fantasy VIII. And then as, as <laughs> the processional was going down the aisle, it was the ending theme. So the song that's rolling during the credits was 
the processional. See, you should have just used uh, you should have just used the music from Ultimisha's Castle because that's already yep. on an organ. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And then as we were coming <laughs> out, we had the gold saucer. Yeah, yeah. That, that dun, was the dun, that was the recessional dun, dun, music at our dun, wedding. Dun, 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 dun. I actually told Eric. Eric was sitting and watching me do Ultimisha's Castle. I'm like, do you think there's a guy actually playing the <laughs> organ in there? He's like, finish the game. God already. damn it! Hurry up! My fingers are getting tired. <laughs> She's like, come if on. If I stop playing this organ, Omega's going to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, What were some of your guys' favorite parts of this game? Oh, boy. Uh, I guess, you know, if I had to pick one of the most, you know, favorite points, I have to say, and I know this is going to be incredibly vague, but I think it has to be like when Laguna was finally brought into the picture mm. and you kind of made that connection with everybody. Stuff um, started to click. Yeah. It, I mean, for me, it was like, aha moments like all the time. It's like, oh, great. That's where they're from. And oh, my goodness, that's Ward right over there. And that's Kira. And that's one of those things that you don't remember from early playthroughs is that this stuff makes sense because at the beginning when you first play you're like well, who the fuck is this like what is going on and if you don't play through to the end of disc three you never really know right right how about you kevin uh i'd say like yeah the laguna scenarios were were definitely one of the coolest parts of the game like like eric said but not because you know what's going on but because you're like well this is really weird <laughs> yeah Weird, why is this in the game kind of thing? Mm. And then uh, just like some of the backstory that it gives you, like when you're in Shumi Village and it talks about how uh, Laguna taught ta- taught those rat-looking things how to, how to speak kind of thing. Yeah, it's just, just like little, little flavor things like that that they tossed but in. But you have to go hunt for those, and I like that. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, they're, they're not right out there, but there is a lot of... Uh, a lot of cool backstory stuff that you can find out. One thing about the story I thought they could have done better, and I mean they did to an extent, but I wish they would have just played out Squall's feelings for Renoa a little bit more because Renoa just wanted this guy bad. Oh, and yeah. he was all over her. And he had zero interest. <laughs> He's your 1950s zero. greaser, dude. Like, I know she wants me, baby. Yeah. He's like, so, babe. <laughs> let me let me, uh, let me just brush my hair some more. Get some more grease <laughs> up in there. Go, grease lightning. No, uh, one of the other best parts of the game was uh, the fishing scene with Cypher at the end. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And the scene where they're at, where Renoa and Squall are at the concert, and Squall just tries to totally just <laughs> slap the hell out of Renoa. That is good. I remember you bringing that up at the time. That was. I think, good. and I don't know why, but the 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 scene that will forever stick out for me in this game as being the most impactful is the Squall and Renoa scene up in space in the Ragnarok once they recommandeer it, because that's kind of when they finally commit like okay this is how i feel about you like this is how you feel about me and then that song starts playing and it's the first final fantasy game that's actually got a vocal soundtrack to it and it just it it was this huge turning point in the romantic part of the story and i think that's why i like this game because a lot of final fantasies are very political and this actually deals more with the concept of love and friendship and romance and that seemed easily is one of my favorites in any Final Fantasy. If you if somebody were to say write down Final Fantasy scenes in specific, that's always going to be number one. And I could like vaguely piece together other scenes from other games like in such detail, but this one just sticks out to me the most, and I I absolutely love that scene. Good choice. Good choice. I can buy that. Um, that's it, guys. I don't th- I don't have anything else. I think we pretty. Pretty well covered this game. I kind of liked this format. We of, gutted it out. We really did. Of 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 a of, of a show per disc. So um, if we missed anything, send it to us, factory sealed at manatank dot com. But I feel like we need to talk about what we're going to tackle next because Ooh. I don't know about you guys, but I would kind of like to continue this series where we tackle longer games episodically instead of trying to cram them into one show. I think it's a great idea. I also think it's a great idea. So we had some homework to each come with three recommendations, and then of that we'll kind of decide. Kevin, what'd you decide on? 
Um, I think you should go first. Okay. I'm going to push for <laughs> Legend of Dagoon for PS1, uh, Lufia 2 for Super Nintendo, and then the only other... I've got I've got a, a backup in case this one absolutely wouldn't work. I really want to play through Dragon Quest VIII Journey of the Cursed King, but that is not on the PS2 classics for PS3, so we would all have to have a physical copy and a PS2. Uh, I think that's the one that you can get for iOS. Let it me is. just check that right it is. now. So you would have that alternative there. There you go. We would need to make sure it's the same game, though, that they haven't made any alterations. I'm I'm assuming it's the same. Well, no, I mean they're they they usually make some sort of changes to it. Like it's usually the the 3ds version that gets ported yeah. over. Well, they don't but, have a 3ds uh, version of that. It's the straight PS2 port. Well, then, then I guess we're all fine. So that those are my three suggestions: Legend of Dragoon, Lufia 2, Rise of the Sinistrals, or Dragon Quest VIII: Journey of the Curse King. Derek, what do you got? Okay, I got two that I really want. And we kind of talked about it, you know, last, last, uh, but I got, uh, I would say that The Secret of Mana for SNES would be one of my, uh, kind of go-tos. Otherwise, the one that I really wanted to tackle, and I brought this up last show, was Chrono Trigger. Um, Chrono Cross, I guess, if we had to pick a third one, would be my third. But it's such <laughs> hogwash garbage that I don't even that know if I want to invest the time into it. game has the worst combat system of any RPG. I challenge you to find a dumber it, combat it's system. It's by far the worst sequel to any game in, in the history. Worse than, you know... I uh, even had a friend who was a, just a rabid Chrono Cross fan try to walk me through it, and he couldn't even sell me on it. It was that shitty of a game. I refuse to play that game. But if you want us to play it, we'll play it. Ah, well, like I said, Chrono Cross would be uh, a very low on the list. I only bring that up because of bringing up Chrono Trigger. Okay. Kevin, what do you got? <laughs> uh, I also have Legend of Dragoon on my list. Ooh. <laughs> uh, Final Fantasy X. Okay. Ooh. Oh, but we just did a Final Fantasy. I feel like game, we should so take a break because uh, we've done two yeah, episodic yeah. Final Fantasy series now. So, and my third choice, which I know is never going to happen, is Seventh Saga. Oh yeah, Saga Seventh Saga. That game is so hard. It's by it's been called the the hardest RPG ever. I made remember it. getting so frustrated with that game twenty minutes into it. It's so hard. Yeah. Huh. It's unbelievably difficult. Okay, so let's not do so that I, one. So I could understand if that one does not get put on the list. Let's not do Final Fantasy X right now. Um, okay. Well, I think it's pretty obvious I could get here. behind... We got the... Legend of Dragoon that you guys both came up with. I'm more casual gamer here, so you guys... I think Legend, Legend of Dragoon... Legend of came out right around the same time as Final Fantasy VII, and it got over... It got overlooked because of that. Um... I don't necessarily want to do Chrono Trigger because I feel... You guys have played that before, right? Yes. Okay. I want to do something I've played it a that times. none of us have played. I'm not doing Chrono Cross, so I'm taking that off the list. At least for now. Secret of Mana, I've never completed it. That's the only thing. I've started it. Kevin's played it before, though, right? Uh, I have not completed it either. I was going to say that... You and uh, I started it. If I were to make uh, a list of the games on all three of our lists, it would be... Secret of Mana, probably Legend of Dragoon, and maybe Lufia. My my vote against Lufia is that I have not played the game before See, that. See, and I, I, I admit that I thought Lufia 2 was a sequel, and I guess I probably... It is not. It's a prequel. And that's, I feel stupid for not ah, having realized that. Well. So geez. it's... You can play two before going to one, but playing two and then going to one is a huge step backwards because two progresses the battle system so much over number one that it'd be regressing. Um, Dragon Quest Eight is a super long game. I have yet to talk to anybody who's beat it in under 80 plus hours. Ooh. Wow. So, and that's doing a lot of stuff. So... Do we want to hold off on that one? 
I guess it sounds like <laughs> Legendary Dragoon might be our best bet then. And see, I was going to say we could do Secret of Mana. And do a two-part show. If we could figure out a way how to do the three-player. Oh, that'd be really kind of hard to... Well, finagle. I've got it working 100% now. Dan and I play a lot of Super Nintendo games multiplayer. We would just have to find times that yeah. we could all get together and do it. And and that's the tough part, right? Because I think a game like that, like we might want to start something like that uh -huh. and keep it as on like the back burner. Because I think if we're going to play Secret of Mana and we're going to, the three of us sit down and do a show about it, it doesn't make sense to not play yeah. it together because it's a three player yeah. game. Okay. Um, so we should see if we can figure out scheduling because Derek is getting ready to move. Yep. Back to the old central time zone. So it looks like right now we're at a toss-up between Legend of Dragoon and Lufia. How long is Legend of Dragoon? I couldn't tell you. I have no it idea. It makes it easy to break it up because it's four discs. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think so. Can you hand it yeah, to me? Yeah, it is four it's discs. alphabetized right there. It is four discs, yeah. Dragoon, JK. I'm telling you, you don't have to look at it. I just want to look, look at, at it. Four discs. You don't have to look. <laughs> just trust me, Eric. Well, what do we think, guys? Dragoon? Dragoon. You can get it on PSN for six bucks. Really? Perfect. Yeah. I already have it on PSN. I got it for 99 so cents. So I got it when it was on super sale, too. Oh, son of a bitch. Looks like yeah. I'm spending more money. <laughs> oh. All right, guys. Six <laughs> All right, so here's our schedule coming up. We're not recording any more Factory Seals. The rest of this, like, none this weekend, none next week, and none the weekend after. Um, we will be back with the formal show on the 7th, but if we wanted to record the first episode, like the week of the first, we could work something like that out. We'll figure all that stuff out later, but we're tackling Legend of Dragoon next. Dun, dun, dun. Kevin, where can we find you on Twitter? Uh, you can find me at Dinner Dangle. Derek, you got to get yourself Twitter set up so you can get involved in this. I think it's time. Like I said, I do have one set up more for professional purposes, not for my gaming desires. So I'll get that established. All right. You can find me at Honest Pizza. That's going to do it for Final Fantasy VIII. Thanks for listening. So long, folks. Got any uh, suggestions for other stuff you want us to play? Shoot us an email. Find us on Facebook. Send us a tweet. We will see you all next time. <laughs>